Hi, welcome to Stat Stuff. I'm Matt Hansen. What do you do when you have a major change in the process, such as when you implement improvements in a project? How do you reflect that impact of the change in a control chart so that the same old upper and lower control limits aren't used? Well, in this lesson, I'll show you how you can update your existing control charts by recalculating those control limits to account for major changes in your process. Now, this lesson is really only meaningful if you've already reviewed the other lessons that cover the different control charts. So, if you haven't already done so, I recommend that you at least review those lessons first. But for now, let's start with a review again of how to read a control chart. Well, how do you read control charts? Well, control charts plot the data points, usually using continuous type of data. Over time, they define a few things for us. They first define the observations, the data points from the data set that should be in a pre-sorted order, like a date-time order. Also, it would plot for us the mean, the average for all the data points. Also, the lower control limit, which represents three standard deviations below that mean, and the upper control limit, which is three standard deviations above the mean. Also, it would include any special cost tests, which could be any of eight different rules that could be predefined to help identify any potential special causes in the data. So just as a way of illustration, we can look at a particular control chart example, which tends to be similar for most of the control charts that we'll be looking at. First within this control chart, you can see that all the observation points are being highlighted here. We can see that there are 20 different observations that should be reflected here in time, like a date and time order, starting from the left all the way to the right. And then we also plot on here the mean, that is the average for the entire data set. All these observations, the average is reflected here within our sample average. Then we've got an upper control limit, which is three standard deviations above the mean. And then we've got a lower control limit reflected as three standard deviations below the mean. Then we have over here this region that falls within the red lines. This is the expected variation region, where that's where we would expect there to be some common cause variation falling back and forth around the mean, hopefully not falling outside of these upper and lower control limits, which is our unexpected variation region. That's where we might see some obvious special causes when they fall outside of our upper and lower control limits that are defined here by the red lines. And we also see in this example, there's one data point that falls below into that area. So we can say for this observation number seven, it failed the test because the data point fell outside of the lower or upper control limit area. Now, one thing to keep in mind that's really important is that control limits that are used in here in charts like this are not the same thing as spec limits, which is the LSL or US or USL. The spec limits are usually going to be tied to the voice of the customer, what the customer wants, the requirements that they set. Those are the targets. That's what the spec limits refer to. Control limits, though, are just reflecting how the process is performing of whether it's in control based off of the variation in, rel in relationship to the mean. So it's based off of three standard deviations from the mean. So you can have a process that's actually considered to be in control, but not necessarily meet the customer's requirements defined by the upper and lower spec limits and as well as vice versa. All right, now let's go over how you can recalculate those control limits in the control charts. Well, you need to remember the control limits typically reflect the voice of the process and how the process is performing, and it could conflict with the voice of the customer, that is, the VOC or what the customer wants and what they're expecting. So process could be considered in control, which is good, but still may not meet the customer's requirements, which is bad. The control charts are very effective for helping us define special cause variation that could help us improve the overall process and eventually help affect and to meet the voice of the customer or meet their requirements. So when is it going to be appropriate for us to change the control limits that are reflected within control charts? Well, control limits are only going to be changed or recalculated when there's a change in the process itself. Now, with the mini tab, when you go to a control chart to build one within the dialog box, click on the chart options and then you go to the stages tab. And then you add the column within your data set that defines when the observations reflect a different part of the process. So as an example, if this was your raw data, typically the type of data you might only need for building a control chart as an example, where you have one row across different columns, would be these first four columns where you have each of these groups identified and you have three different sets of samples and a value for each of those different groups. But what you could do is add this additional column in here where this column is reflecting these are the data points for the old process and there's some sort of change that occurred. Maybe the improvement that was put in place now that you're in the control phase, you might want to track here's where we put that new process into place or that change. And so this is where we want to begin tracking the different level of performance in the process after that 
that change was implemented. So we might plot the chart like this. When we identify this actual value in here in the stages tab within the dialog box for this type of chart, it might look something like this. The results come out like this, where we would see the values here for that column where you define the old process and new process is what actually recalculates your control chart in the middle of the control chart where you have this dashed line represented here where there is the break between the old and the new process. And they're labeled up here for each section as well. This reflects the old process and here's where the new process begins. Now if you notice if we didn't have that then all these data points in the new process would all mostly be out of control or be right on this line for the upper control limit because it would have looked like it was bad. But in this case when there's a new process you'll notice that there's also a lot less variation in this process which is good. That's what we're hoping for. And there's also no special causes or error or failure points within our data as well within this new process. So this would be an ideal stage where we want to reflect in here a different uh, point in time. Now we can have multiple stages represented in here by multiple values and here we just chose two, the old process and the new process. And you can have more if you if you had more in your data, but at least it gives you that option. If you want the control limits to be recalculated so that way you can redefine where those, those tests are going to be run based off whether you have in this example like an old process or new process. It could be really helpful to see that difference. And this is a great kind of chart when you want to communicate that, for example, in a project storyboard to your sponsor or to whoever your audience is to show the improvement over time. You can see the as is right next to the 2B that has now been implemented and you can see the improved difference since implementing that new improvement. All right, before we close this lesson, let's discuss how we can apply some of these concepts in a practical way. I'd like you to refer back to any of the two critical metrics that you might have used as a practical application for the prior control chart lessons. For example, when we went over the IMR chart, XBARS chart, P chart, or the U chart. Now go back to this sort of the, the, the data that you used that was sorted historically and you had at least 20 different observation points that were recorded in there and try to add an additional column that would contain some sort of discrete value per row which would allow for grouping your data into at least two or more groups similar to the column that we use in this example to show old process versus new process. So try to do the same definition within your data as well. Now if there happen to be logical changes or trends in the data anyway then that's the ideal stage where you want to show that breakpoint for segregating the data across those two or more groups. Then rerun the same control chart that was previously run for that metric and select in this case the new column within the stages tab of the options box where you can segregate the data. Then ask yourself for each of those metrics that you're evaluating here. After you segregated the data across those grouped stages, was there any data point that still failed the first test? That is where it fell outside of the lower upper control limits. If there were any failures like that, then were those failures also failures in the original control chart before you actually added the stages? If they weren't, then why do you think those stages may have caused the difference here? Well, that wraps up this lesson. Check out statstuff.com for many more resources that can help you achieve powerful results. I'm Matt Hansen. Thanks for watching.